Today, we have the pleasure to have with us Dr. Scott Harris. He is an Associate Professor in College of Charleston in the USA. Scott Harris' research is related to coastal plain and continental shelf stratigraphy, geomorphology, and landscape evolution, quaternary sedimentation, geology, applied shallow earth geophysics, geological mapping, geographic information systems and geodatabase development and management. Last year, Scott accomplished his sabbatical here in National and Capodistrian University of Athens and we have ongoing research in Theologos, in Marathon Bay and in the western coastal zone of Naxos. Scott, we are glad to have you here again with us. Oh, you ready? Okay, yeah, my pleasure. I just wanted to show the students. Um, I live right here. And um, there's a lot of rain today. So if we get disconnected, I meant to say this earlier, um, just hang out and I will be right with you. We have another platform I can use um, to, uh, to get online. It might take me a few minutes to get that going. So if we do get disconnected, please hold on and I'll, I'll get there. Um, but yeah, Nikki and I, we've been working and trying to figure out the best way. And can y'all hear me okay? Is this good? Yeah. Okay, um, Nikki and I have been working on a way to uh, facilitate working with each other's students and, and lecturing and possibly doing research with them in the future. Um, and as uh, Vasilis said last year, I was on a, a Fulbright Greece um, scholarship. I was a Fulbright fellow. Um, and that's been pretty neat to, to be able to interact like that. There are scholarships also for students like you who may be wanting to come to the United States to work. Um, the Fulbright Foundation was set up in the United States and it's all over the world. Um, different countries, representatives from different uh, countries uh, come to the United States as well. Um, both students and um, academics um, uh, come. So um, I have been studying the shorelines for a long time. Um, you know, we're right here um, at the College of Charleston. Can y'all see when I click the little control button? The little circle that pops up. Okay. Anyway, I'm down here at the College of Charleston. I went to school for my undergraduate here in Williamsburg. Um, went, got my master's in Charlottesville and my PhD up here in Delaware. And I've studied the coastlines uh, pretty intensely from basically Delaware down into Georgia, mostly focusing in South Carolina. And so you'll see a lot of examples from the South Carolina studies. I'm gonna move our little pictures out of the way um, so I can actually see a little bit better. Um, but you know, one of, the, one of the items that we think about, oh yeah, here's our distance. Um, we're about 800 and almost 9,000 9, kilometers from each other. Um, and that's about a 13 hour flight going your direction, about 16 hours coming back. Um, but there are lots of different coasts all over the world. Um, this is what my coast looks like. This is about five miles from my house. This is Folly Beach. And of course, this is um, uh, near Adelante um, up in Theoda. Um, and those guys can point it out to you. This is when I was there last summer. Of course, you all have a lot of rocky coasts. And I think Nikki is going to discuss that with my students tomorrow. Um, but this is what our coast really looks like here on the most of the eastern United States. Changes a little bit here and there, we'll discuss that. Um, but we are really on a divergent plate boundary. Um, and the divergent plate boundary, we don't have a lot of uh, tectonics. We do have earthquakes here in Charleston. Um, in 1886, we had an earthquake of a magnitude approximately 7.2, which leveled a good portion of the city. Um, so we've had, we do have that, but it doesn't really affect the coastline very much that we can see. Unlike in Greece, of course, there's a lot going on. <clears throat> Today, we're going to talk about the distribution of the coastlines. I want to go through sort of uh, where they're found, and I think y'all may know why they're found in those places, but we'll still discuss that a little bit. Um, I am going to go into more details about the evolution of the U.S. East Coast, long term, the plate tectonic level looking at the interglacial periods. Um, the coast that we see now has been repeated over and over and over again. Um, then I'll go into thousands of years and look at the modern sea level rise along our continental margin. Um, then go into the recent, maybe look at some human, human habitation and talk about some of the hazards 
Um, we'll talk about the primary driving forces and the factors associated with that. Modern coastal landscapes, if we have a chance and, you know, maybe an hour six of this lecture, we'll get into the legal framework. Just kidding. That was a joke. Um, and uh, then maybe some current and future thoughts. We might have to skip to that directly. Yeah, Nikki said, I have about an hour, hour and a half, I think. Um, hopefully, I'll be able to hold it to that amount of time. Um, so, everywhere has a geological history, and that geological history imparts some sort of reaction to the sediments and the coastal dynamics um, that occur later. Um, the coast re responds to this underlying layer. It's that it's sort of a fabric that the modern coast is running across. And of course, you know, if there's an old deep valley, then the coast is gonna respond to that. Probably in our part of the world, we would have an inlet formed over deep river valleys that may have been when the sea level was much lower. Um, are y'all familiar, and just feel free to raise your hand. Are, <clears throat> are y'all familiar with the last glacial maximum? You'll hear me say that a lot. Um, when sea level was at its minimum about uh, 20,000 years ago? Yes? No? I ask lots of questions. So just, just raise your hand and say yay or no. <laughs> no, okay. And can you all understand me? Am I, am I speaking clearly enough? I just want to make sure the English is good and all that. For, from my standpoint, sometimes I use words that, that may be colloquial and not as well understood. Um, and so anyway, the, the, the changes that we see are actually responding to some of the actions that occurred hundreds of millions of years ago. Um, the past is the key to the future. Um, long time ago, long time ago, and then more recently we'll go through that. And remember, um, this is not only coasts are not only destructive, we often hear about the erosion, but they're also constructive. And, um, you know, we have barrier islands forming. If you see multiple beach ridges, that means the coast has been migrating seaward. And so it's not all erosion. Um, and we have lots of surficial uh, features and, and coastal change that we'll get to a little bit later. But let's start back 255 million years ago. Um, this is where we were, oh, sorry. This is where we are right, or I am right now. You're over here on this little piece of sliver. Um, and I just thought I'd add y'all in there so you could see where you were. Um, here we have the Atlantic o Ocean that's opening. In this part of the world, we have the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. We have all of these fracture zones that have occurred. And these fracture zones actually go up under the modern continental margin, the continental shelf that we have today that are influencing our coastlines. Um, and here we are at, uh, in the Cretaceous, the end of the Cretaceous, um, where here there's a mid-ocean ridge, the Atlantic Ridge. Here y'all are getting ready to stick up there a little bit. And um, in the modern, um, this is what South Carolina looks like. This is the state that I live in. Um, let me uh, bring up a quick image, see if it'll... I'm not down in South America. There we are. There we go, here is South Carolina here. So this is South Carolina, this is Washington DC, which you probably know very well, and then Miami is down here and Cuba a little bit to the farther to the south. Um, so this is South Carolina here, see the outline? And then here is South Carolina. <clears throat> and South Carolina, these colored sections of orange and brown and yellow um, this is called the coastal plain, and these are the accumulation of sediments over the last, well, uh, since those continents started breaking apart. And each one of these represents multiple sea level high stands. So when sea level was higher, this boundary in particular, running here between the upper and middle coastal plain is quite prominent. Um, it's a very, very strong feature and it looks like a shoreline um, in the aerial photos. If we look here on this map, can you see the color difference here along this boundary from the lighter color to the darker color? This is that shoreline I was mentioning. So anyway, they're very clear, they're very distinct up and down the eastern seaboard. And we are, and I'm located right here. This is the Charleston area. 
This is the Myrtle Beach. Maybe you've heard of Myrtle Beach, South Carolina, a big tourist um, beach uh, area. So anyway, so above that, we have the granitic rocks and we have metamorphic rocks all through the Piedmont and the Blue Ridge. And this is where the sediments are coming from to breach our coast. And so, of course, down in the coastal zone, we have to have sediment. Otherwise, we would end up with a rocky coast. But because we have the sediment being eroded off of this ancient landscape, they're coming down in the rivers and being deposited and they're washing up and down and back and forth through time. This is another view. Here is South Carolina outline. This is North Carolina and Virginia. But these are the river systems. And this is the river, these are the river systems that have brought sediment down. Right now, Charleston does not have a large river coming into it. Um, this river comes down. This is the largest one, uh, the Savannah. And here we have the PD rivers. You don't need to remember those names, but they are providing sediment through time into these areas. And here's about 100 kilometers, if that helps give you a scale. We're going to zoom into this area, and I'm going to take you through some of the environments that we see on the modern landscape <coughs> and what they represent. Here we have the fall zone, and this is where we, well, this is a little bit above the fall zone in the Piedmont, and um, here you can see the granitic rocks. Um, these are slightly different, slightly metamorphosed, and you've got waterfalls, and so up in here, this is where the sediment's coming from. These rocks are weathering, eroding. Um, you're getting transport and deposition uh, down towards the coastal plain through the river systems. Um, here, this is a little spot you'll notice up here in the top left or top right. This is right at the fall zone, a little bit down, and this is some of the ancient marine deposit. This is actually an eroded remnant, um, and these are all little layers. They're actually, if you go up close to it, you can see shells and burrows, but this ancient landscape is also eroding, and these, these sediments that were pulled out of the Piedmont and Blue Ridge that have made it down into the coastal plain are now being reworked. Um, these are uh, much, much older deposits than we have in our modern system. Um, they are made of limestone. Here are two of my students and uh, one of the uh, park uh, rangers down in this part of the world. This is called the Santee limestone. And this limestone dissolves away. This is an Eocene deposit. And um, we actually have caves that you can get into. Um, you see that there's light around them. They're actually, if they look up, they're looking into the forest. Um, this is actually a window um, and there's a stream coming out of it. You can actually follow it all the way out to the other side of the hill and if it's not too wet, you can actually get all the way through. I know y'all know about caves a lot. Y'all have a ton of caves in Greece, which is absolutely lovely. And here we have swamps. These are what the swamps typically look like. This one in particular is up in the up near the fall zone, but this is what they look like from the fall zone down to the coast. Uh, that's our department chair there, um, uh, Dr. Callahan. He just became our department chair, and he takes students up there for looking at hydrologic studies. But you can see the large trees, vegetation. We can see swamps like this, or former swamps, out on the continental shelf. Um, we can actually find beautiful swamps out here on the shelf offshore of South Carolina. Um, of course, they're dead now, um, but they're there showing us that sea level has been rising. This is what it looks like at the edge of the barrier islands. <coughs> Um, you can see there's some stork populations there. This is right on the fringe. We still have freshwater vegetation, but as sea level in, uh, incurs into the area, those trees start to die out and we start getting marsh. This is a marsh grass. This is called, uh, spart um, this is called, oh goodness, which one? Yeah, this is uh, called needle rush. And when you walk through here, it'll actually stick you like little tiny needles will poke into you. But this is the modern marsh. And then, of course, we have the modern barrier system. Um, so sea levels rise and sand moves. Um, I guess one question is, do we care that sea level is rising? Do y'all care? Yeah, maybe, maybe a little bit. Okay. And, um, you know, what's really going on at the coast? Um, we have a lot of politicians that like to speak about the coast and um, they're not really good at understanding what's going on, but they make policies. Um, 
sometimes their policies are well informed, others are politically informed. You know, when the constituents in an area, the people in an area, there's a lot of money um, to be made at the coast. And so, you know, putting houses up and trying to develop and um, maybe not the best practices in some areas, some areas it's fine. Uh, in South Carolina, we do have some very stable coasts um, that are sandy. Um, you know, we have some very unstable coasts that are sandy as well. And we'll, we'll talk about those and where are they most stable? And these are some questions I want you thinking about as we go on today is to really try to understand where do we have stability, where do we not have stability, um, and why that might be uh, the case. If you look at this image in particular, you can see this little tiny spit of sand down here. It's part of a bigger system, but you can probably tell that this is not very stable. Um, one storm will wash across that. And the most recent storm we had in the fall, um, Hurricane Matthew really did some damage out here. The water was washing directly across the island very easily. Nobody lives out here. Um, this is out on a cape that you have to take a boat to get to. So not nobody really lives out there. There's a lighthouse and things like that. Um, here in the aerial, in the aerial photo, um, here is a little sandy beach. Here is, uh, these are really bushes and shrubs, small trees in this area, the dark green. Here, there's a little tidal creek. Can y'all see that very well? Yep, you can see the little tidal creek there. Here's a little lake. The dark colors are often lakes. I'm just telling you this so if we see some more, you'll have an understanding. And this is marsh in this area. <clears throat> so let's talk about sea levels. So we talked about the continent splitting up. Let's talk about some sea levels. If you notice down here, this is the age along the bottom, 600,000 years ago, and the modern, okay? Here is zero, which is showing modern sea level, and down here is about 125. These are a lot of different sea level curves and interpretations, um, but it gives you an idea that about, here's 400,000, 300,000, 200,000, 100,000, that about every 100,000 years, sea level has been high with some wiggles, lots of wiggles, but this is from the ice ages. So this was the last time it was warm, about 80,000 years ago. And then we went into an ice age um, up to about 20,000 years ago. And then sea level started rising very rapidly again. And we'll talk about that a little bit more. Um, and I'll show you some, some images uh, with that. Um, this is a cl little cleaner picture. And we number these, the odd numbers, one, uh, enna, penda. <laughs> um, these are the odd ones are the um, high stands of sea level, the interglacials, and the even numbers are the cold periods, okay? Does that make sense? So if you hear me say stage five or marine isotope stage five, that's what that means. And that's related to this oxygen 18 curves. We won't get in that today, but maybe Dr. Um, Evelpidou will um, give you some more information on that in the future, if you haven't already had it. So <clears throat> during those sea level changes that I just showed you, during each one of those high stands, sea level has come up. Um, this is from Don Calhoun locally. And you'll notice that here's a barrier island. And so you tend to get waves that come in. This is the flooding of the back barrier. There's the filling of the marsh, still getting wave cuts. And then sea level will start to fall. You'll get the migration seaward. You'll get barrier islands and marshes and different terraces. But just remember that all of these environments are migrating back and forth and back and forth across the continental shelf and up to the modern. Here we have a sea level curve again, 20,000 years on the left, 18, 16, 14,000 years ago. This is really for the South Carolina area. And you can see over here, um, minus 40 meters, somewhere around 
12, uh, excuse me, 11,000 years ago maybe, uh, give or take a little bit. And we'll watch the sea level rise across our continental shelf here in South Carolina. I'm gonna take that sea level curve and I'm gonna plot that the shoreline positions in South Carolina through time so you can get an idea about how our landscape has changed. Here we are about 25,000 years ago. The age will be up here. And um, let's see, I did not put a dot in here, but, South, but Charleston is located right about there. I use the brown to represent the land and of course the blue to represent the ocean. Um, the Gulf Stream is running right along here. Um, during this time when the glaciers started melting, you notice over a 5,000 year time period, did things change much? There's 25, there's 20. Not a lot. 15,000 years ago, it's still, the shore, sea level has been rising, but not a lot. Or it's been rising a lot, but there's not been a lot of change along the shelf edge. So let's see, there's 25, 20, 15, 13. Now you might have noticed right down in here, we started getting some marsh forming on the edge from 15 to 13. You notice that change is much more rapid than any change we saw from 25 to 20 to 15. There's a little bit, 13, it really took off 12,000 years ago, still a big point. There's 11,000 years. 10,000 years. So notice between that time period, we really see the sea level moving across the shelf. There's 10, 9, and then this morning. I went out and measured it all. <laughs> um, anyway, so here we can see Charleston is right in this area, and uh, you can see this is how wide our continental shelf is. Um, in working um, uh, this past year in Greece, I was amazed, and one of the reasons I chose that location um, was if you'll notice along here, you know, this is close to a thousand kilometers, and this is over a hundred kilometers. Now, over um, in the areas I was working with just north of Athens, this whole range you could see from the boat. You know, it's like instead of going 100 kilometers to get to the edge of the shelf, I only had to go two or three, which was amazing. And so, you know, the difference between a nice rocky coastline and tectonically active and this type of coastline, very, very different. So in the modern, um, here's sea level rise from 1920 to 2000 here in Charleston gone from about 0.2 meters, negative 0.2 meters, up to about modern since the 1920s. Um, that gives us a two to three millimeters per year that we're rising and there seems to have been some, you know, there's some peaks and some drops and some peaks and some drops, but we've very consistently been rising here in Charleston Harbor. <clears throat> so part two, we've looked at the long time scale, looked at the changes from when the continents split apart from the other continents, plate tectonic scale, moving sediment to the edge of the continent through the rivers, sea level rise, it actually has slowed down in the last 5,000 years from those rapid changes we saw. Um, and now we're reworking sediment at the coast. Are we getting a lot of feedback? I'm getting a little bit of feedback here, but it's not bad. So, now that sea level has come up, let's take a look at where the sandy coasts are. Um, here we are, um, the red dots um, represent small sand dunes. The green lines are well-developed dune systems. And this can be a proxy for where we see sandy coastlines throughout the world. Um, really extensive barrier island complexes here and here off of the east coast of the United States. Um, different areas of the world have very strong barrier island complexes. This is the Mississippi River Delta in this area.
How many people, have y'all looked at the uh, geomorphology of a coastline? Have you actually been out to some of the sandy coasts around you? I'm sure you know what a beach looks like. I'll have some beautiful ones just in there in the Athens area. Um, so I'll just quickly go through this. Um, here we have the back shore. This is where the dune and the, the active beaches or the, the less active beaches. This is where you put your towels out, hang out with your friends. Um, it's nice to be able to hang out there. Y'all have some really fun beaches and I really enjoy kind of going out there to them. Um, we don't have those types of uh, beach facilities in a lot of places here in the States. Um, that area between mean high water here where the tides are and mean low water is called the foreshore. And the tide goes back and forth across this one or two times a day. We have the surf zone here where the bars are, um, or where the, the waves come in. We have the breaker zone, which is where the, the sandbars are. And then we have the offshore area, which is really where, you know, usually that's about 10 meters deep, um, uh, five to 10 meters deep, depending on where you are, where the waves really start interacting with the bottom. So when waves are rolling in, they start interacting with the bottom, they build up and break here in the breaker zone, come through the surf zone, sometimes they'll rebuild, sometimes they're just splashing around they'll wash up here in the foreshore. So the waves being one of the primary driving forces, we also have tides and um, they're very important in certain parts of the world. Um, the three major tidal zones that we think about or tidal ranges we think about in coastal sandy geomorphology um, is here in the greater than four meter where it's very rare to get barrier islands formed in that high of a tide range. Um, usually you'll have big tidal flats in those areas. Um, you know, here's uh, the Bay of Fundy up in this area where the tides are, you know, well above 10 to 15 meters at very, very high tide ranges. Um, and they're not all on here. This, this area right up in here in uh, the Sea of Cortez has about a four meter tide range and no barrier island um, uh, in most of the areas. Um, here we have the mesotidal, which are these hatchard areas. This is where basically I live, right in this area. And so we have beautiful sandy coast in there and microtidal areas, um, they also will have a lot of barrier island um, depending on tide range. And re remember, um, oh, the different types of tides, just to bring it back. Diurnal is basically um, single uh, high tide per day. Semi-diurnal might have two high tides per day. And then they have mixed, where you sort of go through this little, sort of a mixed semi-diurnal where you've got, you have two high tides a day, but one of them's lower than the other. And uh, these do impact Sandy Coast. They impact marshes, they impact um, how they're formed. Um, waves, are often measured in significant wave heights. I just put this little diagram in case y'all ever become wave experts. Um, you know, on, if you go out and you sit at the beach for months on end, you might see that the average wave height is right here. Significant wave heights actually represent the upper one third of the waves, so this little break point here, and it's that average of the one third of all the wave heights. And that's called the significant wave heights. Um, oceanographers and coastal geomorphologists realize that this is the range that really has an effect on coastal geomorphology. The day-to-day, -day, eh, it has its effects, but it's not nearly as significant as this. And this is why they call it the significant wave height. It's significant in being able to change the morphology of the coast. You know, these are where we start getting big storms, nor'easters um, or cyclones and um, tropical cyclones and extra tropical cyclones in, this, in the United States. <clears throat> Waves also have different sizes related how they actually reach the coast. So imagine a wave coming across deep water um, in an area like um, Hawaii out in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. 
big waves coming across a very steep continental shelf, slope and a very narrow continental shelf. In other words, the waves can immediately hit the modern coast. Here, on the east coast of the United States, we might have waves coming in, but they start breaking because we have a very gentle continental shelf. Um, you saw how the sea level rose across it, and the waves start really interacting heavily with the bottom, the big waves do, and they start losing energy before they even reach the coast. So on the west coast, where we tend to have rockier shorelines and less sandy beaches, we, we have a lot of waves, high energy coming in. And on the east coast, we have a lot more gentle wave systems coming in. That's going to change how the barrier islands res respond and how the sandy coasts are going to respond. Y'all with me still? Okay, just making sure you can still hear it all. So, taking the tides and the waves, a guy named Miles Hayes back in the 1980s, 70s and 80s, um, after Davis in the 1960s, started developing this idea relating the tidal range that you can see on this graph to the uh, left and the wave height that you can see down here in the bottom. And the barrier islands, he noticed, started, th there was a pattern uh, about this. If you look at the tide range, particularly along the South Carolina coast, and this is why it's, you know, I, I, I live here, but this is the South Carolina coast here is the classic section for what we call a mixed energy tidal system, where you have a moderate amount of waves, but really good tides. We have about a meter, one point, um, or 2.5 meter wave tides, and about a meter, meter and a half waves here in central South Carolina, which puts us on this chart somewhere in this area, maybe a little bit farther down, um, which puts us in this MT, which is mixed tidal. Um, this is mixed wave, and this is wave dominated. And this is tidal dominated. And basically up in this zone here, you don't really get barriers from maybe here up into here. A couple of them do show up, um, but they, they're really not that prominent. So by looking at the tide, if, if you were to go to another planet and say, this is the tide regime and this is the wave regime, coastal geomorphologists could say, oh, well, that should have this type of barrier island. Okay, so um, where do you fit? Where does where do different parts of um, your coastlines fit? Do you have a large tide range there in Greece? Yeah, it's no tide. Yeah, it's it's you know down here, right? So if you change your waves just a little bit, you know, from nothing, you might get a little bit of tide, and you might be able to get a little tidal, you know, tidal domination, but if you move over with just a little bit of waves, you're actually going to get a wave-dominated barrier system. And I'm going to show you what those two look like very specifically um, in just a minute. I'm going to talk to you first about some of the other types of beaches that we see. Um, in Australia, a guy named Andy Short, Andrew Short, um, studied, this was his basically life's, life's work. He was able to drive to and take a helicopter to 10,685 beaches. <laughs> that is a large data set. The dude just hung out at the beach all the time. Um, and uh, so he was looking at the waves, tides, and sediment regime. And he came up with three primary types. We don't use these a lot in the U.S., but they are used a lot in the rest of the world. Um, you know, the U.S., we tend to do things differently sometimes. Sorry about that. And um, yeah, apologize for the current things. Um, but anyway, he called them dissipative, an intermediate, and reflective. So the two end members, dissipative and reflective, if we think about the coasts in the United States or here in South Carolina, they tend to be dissipative for the most part. And I'm going to take you through those types. I zoomed in. This is a, so this is a chart that he came up with. 
when he went to these 10,000 beaches, almost 11,000 beaches, he measured a lot of different parameters about them. And so here we show the dissipative all the way down to the reflective. And he has, not only does he have these types, I think he has somewhere around 25 different types. So if you type in all the parameters, if you go to any beach, you type in the parameters, you should be able to fit your beach into this categorical system. And it's actually, it's quite complicated, but it's actually very useful for engineering and, and other practices that, that help um, people understand beaches and how they're gonna respond in different situations. So here's dissipative, we'll talk about that first. And sorry about the quality here, I pulled it out of his um, article. This is from the Journal of Coastal Research. You can actually go on there and um, open and look at this article for free. But here we have the distance offshore, 400 meters. Um, we have usually an outer breaker zone in the dissipative, a trough, an inner bre breaker zone, and then the active beach. There's not a long, there's not a lot of longshore transport. And this is what it looks like from the top and then in a cross section. So here's the modern beach going down, here's a trough, and here's the breaker zone. So this is dissipative across this entire region. And that tends to be a lot of the beaches that I see around here. Um, some of them get a little more intermediate where you might have a straight bar that's offshore, a, a sandbar, or you might have a sandbar that has these little crescents in it. You notice that it's not straight, but there's actually a little crescent. And can you all see my mouse moving on the screen? I forgot to ask that earlier. You can? Yes. Okay, good. Um, <clears throat> notice here, we have both a dissipative domain and a reflective domain. So the beach has become much steeper in this area. But we're still breaking the waves across sandbars and there's enough sediment in the system that you're not just slapping waves onto the beach. It's only in this last section where you have a very steep beach really no offshore bar and you have the uh, waves breaking right on the beach and this is called a reflective beach um, notice it's a very very narrow area between high and low tide um, and this is where the waves are breaking so you'll actually get a lot of erosion and i'll go back through these there's the intermediate and there's the dissipative. So we go from dissipative with that gentle slope, intermediate with a little reflective domain, but also a broad dissipative domain. And then here we have the reflective domain. Okay, does that make sense? So we have this, this is more of a, um, an empirical uh, design where he went out and measured thousands of beaches. Um, it's a very thorough, I don't know if he has this data set available online. I've actually never looked, um, but it would be interesting to see if he did for some, you know, to get students to analyze them. But so that's very different than what we were looking at here. Here, this is more of a physical model that says, if you know the tide and if you know the wave, that's all you need. And then you'll have some idea of the barrier island system. In uh, Andy's um, work, really takes a lot of parameters and quantifies the beach very specifically to a lot of those different parameters. Any questions so far? Yes. What is uh, the difference between the east coast, uh, the east coast and the west coast in terms of beaches? In the previous south, of course, with the waves of tide. Ah, uh, over here. <clears throat> In this one? Yes. Yeah, so let me, I'm gonna bring up another, I'll bring this image up so we can look. So if you notice in South Carolina, we have this along most of the East Coast, we have a big broad continental shelf and then it gets deep along the edge, right? So I won't change the scale, but we'll go over here to the West Coast and you'll notice the West Coast very deep all the way up. 
here's a little tiny continental shelf. Very tiny. Here's a little bit more, but it's still deeper here than 100 kilometers offshore. So they're very different systems. Um, <clears throat> and in this area, you'll quite frequently get extremely high wave action, and then we'll zoom out because of this body of water. And so the wave action along the west coast is much larger than the general wave action along the east coast, mainly because of this and the wide continental shelf. Okay, the wide continental shelf here really does break down the waves. Here it's about 40 meters deep along this edge, 40 to 50 meters. And if we go over here, 40 to 50 meters is literally right in here on this edge. So that really affects the amount of wave energy that reaches the coast. And then also, a lot of this coast is very tectonically active. And so you end up with a lot of large rocky cliffs near the coast. So they're two very different systems, along with just the wave energy and the lower tide energy in some of the areas. Some of the areas get very high, um, but you have a very different system there. Did, did that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. But is it the base coat? So it's more susceptible to damage because of climate change or uh, it changes in global circulation. Can, can you repeat that? I'm, it broke up a little bit. The East Coast is much more uh, susceptible to damage because of, uh, because of climate change. So the slope is much more uh, smooth. Yes, yeah, the gentle slope does, it, it really will affect how quickly sea level encroaches on an area, sea level rises into an area because it is such a low slope. Here, <clears throat> you know, you step off the beach and you're extremely high in altitude. Over here, you have to go inland a long ways to get to a, to a, to a similar altitude. <clears throat> so when, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> sorry, I got a thing in my throat. I have to drink some coffee. <laughs> um, so, wind as a driving force. Now, wind we think of, and wind imparts most of its energy on the beach through waves. That's how waves are formed um, for the most part. Um, and the issue that I want to talk about really in this case is building into dunes. And so, here you have a nice pretty little dune. Some of them are only a few meters along the coast. Others may rise up to 100 meters near the coast, depending on what you, where you are and, and uh, how much wind variability there is. I'm not going to discuss this very much. Wind blows dune and blows sand in a pile. comes off the beach usually. Using the same photograph, biota is also very important. It stabilizes dunes and the sand. It has roots that go in and hold the sand together. And then also organisms or other types of, of organisms burrow and they slightly erode. But here, dunes are really helped by these root systems. Very simple, uh, very plain to look at that. So let's think about sediment supply too. Um, are y'all familiar with New Orleans? Yeah, that's down on the Mississippi Delta. The Mississippi River drains most of the central portion of North America and it dumps out right down here. Okay, and so you can see this large delta. Um, sediments coming from the rivers, y'all know that pretty easily, I think. Um, this is piling in from the rivers. There are other areas where sediment <clears throat> comes from the coast itself. It comes from the islands themselves. The islands are eroding over. There's sediment moving down this chain that's being eroded from up in the barrier, and it's being washed across. All the sand in here 
that originally came from the rivers, this may have been reworked during those interglacial periods, MIS 1, 5, 7, 9. These are being reworked and washed into the dune or into the systems you see here. These are little dunes. This is the modern shoreline. This is overwash that we get in those types of areas. And we can also have ancient deposits being reworked directly. Um, this is in Portugal, and there's some beautiful cliffs made of sandstone. And the chunks of rock are breaking down, and they're washing into this coastal area. So rivers, the islands themselves, and ancient deposits are really where your sediment comes from. Um, not a lot coming in from uh, the air, but in some places you'll get the wind blowing it up. So let's look at modern coastal landscapes. This is that Folly Island I was showing you. Um, this is Folly Beach. I'm literally, let's see, where am I? I'm, I'm basically right back here. This is the island itself. And in here, they're actually adding sediment to the beach. Um, there's been a lot of sediment that's been added. Um, there's actually a big pipe right there. You, can you see that little dark streak? It's hard to see from right here. There's a little dark streak right in there. And this is a pump from a ship that's offshore pumping sand onto the beach. Renourishment is a problem in our part of the world or eroding beaches and so they, they put sand on there. You can see that there's a lot of suspended sediment. Can you see the sediment here in the water? Yes. Yep. And we were studying this area because this little island right here, and I'll show you some more pictures of that. <clears throat> I'm going to take you to two different areas. Remember, think back, waves and tides. What do waves tend to do to the coast? Do they tend to, to smooth it out or break it up into little inlets? What do you think waves versus tides? Which one has more inlets and which one has more smooth coast not everybody at once <laughs> can Vasilis, can you repeat that for me uh, i'm sorry Okay, let's take a look, and then, then we'll, we'll rethink that, okay? <laughs> so this is the Outer Banks in uh, North Carolina. <clears throat> Actually, let me go, I'm going to bring up Google again. So here's South Carolina, North Carolina. And if we zoom in to the Outer Banks, this is what that coast looks like. We go from this kill devil here. I'm going up there in a few weeks, actually. But here's the Outer Banks. Here is an inlet. Here is a flood tidal shoal. And notice how far it is to the next inlet. And then here's another inlet. A little inlet. Nice, smooth coast. Another inlet. As we come around into South Carolina, we pick up a few more inlets here. Nice, smooth beach. Now we're down into South Carolina. Let me zoom out for you so you can see where you are. There's Charleston. Nice, smooth beach. Inlet, 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 inlet. Now we're getting a lot more inlets. Lots of inlets down through here. Can you see all of them? Yeah, so there are lots of inlets. Now I'm going to zoom out. Now in this stretch of coast, this is where all the inlets are. Most. And up along here, there are much fewer inlets. And this is what Miles Hayes was talking about in Davis um, back in the 60s, Miles Hayes in the 70s, that <clears throat> in this section of coast here, do you think we're going to have larger waves or smaller waves? given 
proximity to the ocean? Smaller. Well, how wide is the continental shelf here? Is it very wide? No, it's very not. Yeah, so the big waves, you're going to get a lot more waves along this coast. In this area, you actually funnel the tide, and so up here in what we call the Georgia Bight, this area has much higher tide. In some areas, you have three meters of tide. Up here, you only have a meter of tide. And you have larger waves here and smaller waves down in here. The, uh, the mean uh, significant wave height is, I want to say, about 2.3 meters up here and only about 1.2 meters down here. So which area has more tide influence? The northern. Uh, tide. Uh, tide. Yeah, tide. Tide. Yeah. Yeah. So if we look in areas that have a lot of tidal influence, what do you see? Inlets. Lots of inlets. Yeah, exactly. And so up in here where the tide is much less, you tend to have fewer inlets. More waves, that smooths the beach out. Okay, does that make sense? So waves actually help break along the coast and they smooth out sandy coasts. So when you have a lot of waves breaking, you don't have a lot of rock in the area. So it actually can smooth out the coast. Tides tend to go in and out. And so you actually are able to maintain more inlets. And so down here where we have less wave, more tide, we have more inlets. Does that make sense? Okay. So this is the Outer Banks. Um, when we have, now do y'all know, um, know what a delta is, correct? It's a good Greek word, right? <laughs> um, <clears throat> when you have a system such as this, where we have a lot of wave energy, often you'll have a big flood tidal delta where the flood of the tide fills in the back. That's called the flood tide. The flood tide will make a large delta behind the island. If you move down into the South Carol or the Charleston area, oops, sorry, you'll often get a large delta offshore, which this is all part of that system. And you actually have a large ebb tidal delta, the ebb of the tide, which means the ebb is flowing out, and you'll end up with a large pile of sand offshore. So I'm going to show you a little bit more about the Outer Banks. Um, this is a picture, long, smooth barrier. In this little area, can you see that? I don't know what kind of resolution you have on your screen. Can you see this big offset? Yeah, this is because they have a little pipe. Can you see the little pipe along the coast? Yeah, yeah, they've got a pipe here. And they have the same system here. And they're filling in sediment both ways. This is beach renourishment. And they're meeting at uh, the Outer Banks Pier here. Um, but this is back in 2011. And so they were putting sand on the beach because they have such severe erosion. So you notice they've got a good wide beach now. Um, but this is what happens. All the sand that was here, because of the waves have been washing southward along the coast and ending up into the inlets and behind the barriers and offshore. Um, here in the Charleston area, we have lots of inlets. And so does that mean it's more tide or more wave energy? Tide, yeah, good. So there's a little good, good amount of tide in here. And again, this is, I'm right about here. The university's right about there. And this is a big harbor. It's a lot of fun. We were out there on the water the other day. And here we are back to that same picture I showed you in the beginning. This is Folly Beach. Um, <clears throat> here is that inlet. Um, this inlet is 
somewhere between 15 and 22 meters deep. It's actually the deepest spot for another 15 or 20 kilometers offshore um, is in the inlets because you have such tide energy, you're cutting deep holes into the, into the um, seafloor. So these are often called drumstick barriers. Are you all familiar with the phrase drumstick? Yes. You know, like a, like a turkey leg? No, like a turkey. <laughs> um, and so um, that's why they're called drumsticks. They often have a they're they have a big they have a large end and then a, a an end that you can grab with your hand and you bite the you bite the um, leg off of here. Um, here you can grab it on there and bite it off there. And this is a pretty good one right here, Bull Bull Island. That's got a good handle. Then you can eat the chicken leg up there. Okay. <laughs> so this is the classic area of drumstick barriers that Miles Hayes had mapped out. He actually did a lot of work um, on Kiowa Island in the 1970s. Um, this was privately owned um, by one person and then sold to Saudi Arabia. Um, and then the prince got that group to come in and study it in the 1970s. And that's where he came up with a lot of his ideas, Miles Hayes did, about his research. Um, so just to show you, this is Folly Island right here. And we're looking at this little washover fan right here. There's that little washover fan right there. Okay, we changed orientation. So, Charleston is a mixed energy system, wave and tide. It's got a lot more tidal energy than the Outer Banks. Short drumstick barriers, many inlets, usually fine-grained sediments, some coarse, and often a much more gentle beach slope than they have in the Outer Banks. Okay. Notice here, this is a, <clears throat> a much bigger picture. Can you see the breakers, the waves breaking in the distance? This goes out to maybe um, in sometimes two, uh, three kilometers, four kilometers offshore. And um, sometimes when I'm out in the boat, I'll go up there and just jump off the side of the boat with the students in it and, and pretend like, you know, I'm just being crazy and... Uh, but it's really only knee deep. It's, it's only maybe 50 centimeters. Sometimes you'll see exposed sand during really low tides out here. And so there are all sorts of shipwrecks and all sorts of issues that occur out there. But you have this deep channel and this is the ebb tidal delta. You can see the water flowing out. You see the edge here? This is a plume of sediment that's washing out into the open ocean. Ebb tidal delta, inlet shoals, and this is Folly Bay. Just to the north of there is another little inlet. Here's a lighthouse just for a scale, but look at the broad marshes. These are all Spartina alternaflora marshes. You'll often see these. Um, this is where we have a lot of our, um, the fisheries are maintained through the organisms that are growing and living here. A lot of our um, uh, really good, good eating fish, I'm sorry, um, that we get are uh, first living in here. They, they, um, they spawn about 100 kilometers offshore. The little eggs and the little baby fish are washed inland, and they grow up in the estuaries till they're maybe 5 centimeters long, 10 centimeters long, and then they go back out into the ocean. Here is the edge of the ebb tidal delta. And you can see all the shoals. This little edge right here, if you step off, it's about 10 meters deep. A colleague of mine learned that the hard way. The marsh is so dense that it's held up. And uh, he was pushing the boat off and didn't realize it was about a 10 meter step off. And went, oop, he decided. <laughs> 
So let's look at erosion rates. Let's look at how the coast is responding to changes. Um, if you look at this map, this is the Myrtle Beach area. Here's Charleston where we are. Here are all the inlets. And notice where it's, there's major erosion. At the ends of the island, you'll frequently see either major erosion or you might see major accretion in different areas. This is that same inlet. Here's the overwash. And I wanted to show you the position of the shorelines through the ninth, from the 19th century into the modern. Okay, the aerial photo is um, probably within the last year or two. And the red here are the 1850s to 1870s. And here the greens are in the 1980s. And you can see how this <clears throat> island was much farther south. The shoals were a little bit farther south, and the inlet was coming through here. There's been a lot of accretion on this end. This is where the golf courses are. This is where all the rich people live. Um, some rich people here, but not as much. Um, and this part of the island has been collapsing for a long time. Um, they actually just had a project where they renourished this part of the island. So the dynamics are as the shoreline or as sea level has been rising, storms have been coming, this part of the island has completely disappeared. Now, several thousand years ago, the shoreline was back here. The age of this barrier, actually this one may only be about a thousand years old. This little island, can y'all see the green back there? Yeah, so these little shoals, let me bring this up. There's the same spot. All of these little islands back here used to be the modern coast. This goat island was the modern coast about 6,000 years ago. We've dated it and it's about 6,000 years old. These here are about 1,500 to 2,000 years old. These are about 1,000 and the island is only four to 500 years old. Okay, so we had a lot of accretion, a lot of sediment accumulation at the coast but now it's reversed and we're starting to collapse the islands water washes across here on a regular basis this changes drastically and this shoreline i'll bring that up in just a second here at morris island this little lighthouse right here that i showed you from the picture that used to be inland by about 300 meters let me see let me bring that up <clears throat> Here's the coast again, there's Charleston. And if we look down in this area, here's the island that we're talking about a lot. This is Morris Island. And if things draw more quickly, this is on the internet. So here we go. Um, you can see here's that same area we were just talking about. And then here is Morris Island. There's the lighthouse right there. And you can see in the 1860s, 1850s, the shoreline was way, way out here. Here it was in the 1900, 1921, 1955, 1962, 1983, and then the modern. So a lot of dynamic changes here. And I wanna take you up to Bulls Island to show you something that's very drastic. makes it very clear as to how these islands behave sometimes, is that in this case, notice the shoreline from the 1870s here in yellow, and the shoreline has come out, where in this case, the shoreline has eroded. So they're rotating in, in aspects. They're, whoop, there we go. They're moving like this. And some islands have been doing that for you know, hundreds and hundreds of years going back and forth and back and forth. In this case, <clears throat> we only see one episode of that. So because of the tidal inlets and the sediment mass here and here associated with the inlets, they build on. And in this case, you can see all of the beach ridges here, 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 and here. Um, this beach ridge, I think, is about 400 years old. Um, if I'm remembering correctly. 
So we have different ages for these, and you can see the dynamics on those beaches. So back to Charleston, this is Folly Island again. I'm gonna show you a picture here of more recent shoreline change. In August of 2011, Hurricane Irene came by. You can see the big waves out there. Waves breaking over, water flowing behind. The next day, it looked like this. What's missing? Yeah, there's about a meter and a half tall dune that disappeared overnight. Which is kind of fun to watch, kind of. So, um, how are we doing on time? You want to hear a little bit about the legal aspects? Maybe. <laughs> okay. Um, so first off, and I think I think y'all probably have a good idea about this. Y'all are older, so you have a you have a good feeling for, you know, <clears throat> why do we have laws about how we can build on the coast? Um, why do we regulate the coast? Um, you know, in the United States, um, I don't know the Greek regulations as much. Um, in the United States, um, because of old English law, and you know, we were founded by Britain in the uh, eight or gosh, long time ago. Anyway, um, we seceded m more recently, and um, but we did we did receive a lot of the old English law that basically said the public has access to coasts because that is the the beaches were the main passageway and the beaches were the main place for transporting goods and getting them on ships whether they were in harbors or whether they were on the open coast and so there was a lot of legal standing that said that people need to have access to the coast and so that really becomes a public right away for the most part okay and so that's one of the major standings if we allowed people to build right on the beach that might cause a lot of problems for people trying to get back and forth. Um, if the house falls down, who's responsible, all the debris that would be on the beach. And so they have a lot of different laws and regulation. Um, in South Carolina, the, the different statutes, here's the statute number if you wanna look it up, but they actually defined erosion. It's a natural process, which becomes a significant problem only when structures are erected erected in close proximity to the beach dune system. In other words, beach erosion is not a problem until somebody builds there and then the beach runs into the house or the end of the structures. And that's what the South Carolina um, legislature was, was trying to identify. Every state has their own laws related to this. Yes. Um, <clears throat> It's more difficult in practice. This is the this is Myrtle Beach in the 1990s. This is a problem, don't you think? Yeah, where's the high tide line? Can you see that little that little boundary there, the wet dry line? And it intersects this beach. So at high tide, you cannot walk along here in the 1990s. There's that's from Bill Iser, a friend of mine. Um, so it became a problem. Um, but what is a shoreline? In this picture, can you see a shoreline? Where would you put the shoreline? The highest point of the tide. Where? The highest point of the tide, maybe. Okay, the highest point of the tide. Yeah, somewhere right there maybe. Well, there have been a lot of definitions for the shoreline over the years. This is where I would put it if I was mapping for this, you know, for this time period. You could put it at the base of the dune. But Boke and Turner came up, all of these different definitions are in use somewhere. There's a shoreline, there's a shoreline, there's a shoreline. All of these have been used at some point or another. Okay, we tend to be looking at this probably, well, actually, probably K is what we're looking at in this picture. But, you know, this one right here, G or F, is actually right there. 
And then E, of course, that's up in this little spot, too. And then D is back here. So where do you put it? You know, this is a, this is a legal question. How do you define that? Um, most places in the United States, we talk about mean low water or mean high water, okay? Um, the state in South Carolina owns the land between mean high water and mean low water. And that's actually a surveyed, a legally surveyed position that somebody can come out and say, this is where mean high water is. Um, and so they can actually say that. <clears throat> in the 1970s and 80s, there was limited beachfront jurisdiction uh, in South Carolina. A lot was going on. You saw in that previous picture that there were some problems that were already in place that we had to deal with in the 90s. There was a critical line that was established at the landward toe of the primary dune, and that would be right here. The landward toe of the primary dune would actually be right back here. This one, they might consider that, but it's fairly new and it's kind of broken up. So this would have probably been the critical line right there at that point. Can y'all see where I'm pointing? And that critical line was a boundary that the state identified um, so that there was no jurisdiction landward of the line. So the state didn't have any say over what happened up to that point. So if I was building, I could build my house right there and then I could probably hang it over the top if I wanted to. This is how crazy people get. If, if given an opportunity, they would build up to that point and then they would have a deck that was floating in space for another 10 meters um, if they could engineer it. But so that's what the problem was. Seawalls were routinely allowed because they didn't, the state did not have jurisdiction. <clears throat> so the nice beaches were turning into this. This is down at Folly Beach um, just a, oh, a couple of decades ago. So in 1988, they passed this Beachfront Management Act. There's no reason to go into all the details other than <clears throat> it established a baseline um, and a 40 year setback line and determined erosion rates every 10 years. Um, but it got tested almost immediately. 1988, it was passed. In central South Carolina, we had a Category 5 hurricane um, hit the coast in 1989, the year after, which took the shoreline and did this to it in a few hours. The storm came ashore very, very rapidly, and this is the exact same spot. Um, maybe we were, um, Bill was standing yeah, this is Bill Isers. I didn't know. Oh, shoot, I meant to have his name down there. But um, <clears throat> basically, he was standing there in the next picture. And now you can see this erosion. Here's a house that's completely fallen down and destroyed. That one, the roof is ripped off. Um, so that was a test of the legislation. And the legislation said, if your house is destroyed, you can't rebuild. Um, and if things become a problem then maybe you cannot build on your piece of property. And so you can imagine if you owned a piece of property you paid a large sum of money for, that you would be very upset by that. So in 1989, a permit was um, uh, denied. They weren't able to build on this. Uh, Mr. Lucas had two lots and uh, they sued. It went to the United States Supreme Court and they ruled in his favor and remanded the case for damages back to the state. Um, <clears throat> the state purchased the lots for a total of about $1.5 million, and we could not take that kind of uh, financial hit, so then they sold the lots, and they were built on in 1995 and 1998. This is what the houses look like here, and there was another one that was right here. But anyway, they built on it, and uh, then they had houses, and they've been having problems at those lots since. Um, so um, how do you actually establish these lines? This is on an active sandy coast, moves around a lot. So how do they actually do it? Um, there's a standard zone away from the inlets. Um, there's also an inlet zone, um, but we draw a baseline. For inlet zones, the baseline is drawn at the most landward position, and these are a little more complicated. I'm going to show you some pictures that might help. 
Um, and one of the things that people have to realize in South Carolina in particular is that the setback line is not a no build line. It just means you have to get a permit um, so that certain regulations are followed. Um, next year, we will likely begin on a new set of shorelines and jurisdictional lines. It happens about every 10 years. So we have, you know, 1988, 98, 2008, 2018. Oh, that's right. I put that in a different section. So let me take a quick look here. I want to grab a picture just so you can see some of the data that we deal with. So like this is a picture of um, an old one that you can see here is a vertical seawall. And this black line here is in 2006. So they had a renourishment. These are beach profiles. This is on the this is the coast, and this is offshore, um, about 2,500 feet. Sorry, we do feet in this state. <clears throat> so you know, 750 meters or so. Um, but here, this shows the shape of the beach. These earlier ones are from the 1980s and 90s. Then they had a renourishment. They piled sand on. And then they piled sand on again. Um, so instead of just having a bee of, uh, you know, sand out there, they actually had a little place to put your towel now because we, we had to inform the people who were building beaches that, yeah, it's nice to have protection from the houses, but we also want to put our towels out and hang out and play Frisbee and do those things at the beach. So they finally realized, oh, they need some width, um, which is quite interesting. But, um, it, if you ever want to look at beach profiles, I can help you out with that. So anyway, these are just some final thoughts. I've got other things going. Um, sea level is rising despite our political leaders here in the States who don't believe it. Um, they're, they're either very ignorant or very stupid. Um, <laughs> I'll leave that up to the people who might yell at me for saying that. So, um, People that have money live at the coast and they can afford lawyers. And some of these houses will pay an annual tax that is twice or three times my salary. And that's just their tax on an annual basis to the state because it's worth that much money. Um, how often do we allow people to be in harm's way? You know, that's a big question. Um, do we let their homes mess up the beaches? How do we protect the beaches? Quite often we'd use renourishment in South Carolina where we look for offshore ran sand resources and try to pump sand onto the beaches. How do we protect the people? Um, how much money do we put into it over common sense about living at the beach? And there are economic reasons. I mean, you know, there's a lot of money that's at the coast. And so spending $3 million on Buying sand from offshore might be worth it in many cases. So I'll leave you with those pictures and ask you if you have any other questions that you might want to ask about stuff, things that I may have missed or questions you might have. Speak up a little bit. I, I can barely hear you. Uh, the nourishment of the beaches? Yes. Okay. Is it a, a, I mean, yeah, so yeah, so they do. They renourish the same spot over and over again. Um, what? Um, it depends on where you are. In Myrtle Beach to the north of here, let me bring up an image. Uh, there it is. Um, it, it's a mixture. Um, so here in Myrtle Beach, their beach is often, it's a lot more stable, particularly in these areas. So they may go every 10 years or so, you know, maybe even 15, but I don't think they've waited that long. <clears throat> In areas to the south, like on Deberdu, which is a private beach, um, you can only access this beach by boat. 
Um, and then they still don't like it, even though it's public right away. Um, they, they pay for it out of pocket. The homeowners do. They have a lot of money. This is where movie stars live. This is where politicians go. Um, but it's not the wealthiest beach on the, in the state. So private monies pay for that. And they go out here. There's sand resources in this area. And I think out here that they go out, they pay somebody to go out. And there are a lot of permitting regulations. They get pumped on the beach. This one occurs every eight to ten years, I believe, on Deborah Dew. As we come down to Folly Beach, Folly Beach has problems. Now remember, I live right here, right next to the Coffee Star. <laughs> <laughs> Folly Beach has very bad erosion problems. Um, many people think because the harbor entrance, they put jetties here. And so the jetties have caused a lot of sediment that was normally going along shore. It's piling up right here and not allowed to go south. Okay. So Folly Island, we just had a renourishment back in 2013. And there are already houses that are having problems. Um, if we go up to this area, you can see these houses here. There was a nice beach out there just a couple of years ago, and this is already eroded back so that there's no beach at high tide. It was supposed to last for five to eight years. Um, this air. If the process accelerating of the erosion year by year, year. It, it, it appears to, because they had the first renourishments back in the 90s, and it lasted for a while, maybe eight years. And then it lasted for five years, and now it's only lasting for a couple of years. Um, there are all sorts of processes that might um, increase that rate. One being, you know, sea level rise on a sort of a longer dramatic term. Um, but the wind energy and the wave energy that's coming in, that could also be causing problems over the last few years. A slight change in our weather patterns may have increased the erosion in this area. Um, Folly Beach, another problem that they have is the renourishment sites are right out here um, in this area. They don't have any more sand in them. And so for the, last, for the last two years, I've been working with not only our State Department of Natural Resources, but we've also been working with the Army Corps of Engineers and um, BOEM, which is our Bureau of Energy and Minerals that handles federal waters. Federal waters stop at five kilometer boundary, 5.2 um, kilometer boundary. Outside is federal, inside is state. So outside, we have to buy the sand from the federal government. Um, and usually because the federal government put in these jetties, which if we zoom in, you might be able to see them a little better. See the little jetties? They're below water most of the time, um, but the jetties causing the erosion, the federal government has said that they will pay for a much higher percentage than other areas. And in the Folly Beach case, the renourishment needs are, are much higher on a more regular basis, so the state pays for part of it. The local government has put a little bit in, but not a huge amount. Down here, at this, this area, you can see there's houses, 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 and then no houses. In this area, this is actually a county park, and the county park has an annual um, uh, Christmas celebration that is over in another part of the county where they, they make millions of dollars every year for letting people see the flashy lights at the Christmas ceremony. So the park service or the, the, the park committee in, in this area is wealthy. They own this. And so when we had that big storm, Irene, that I showed you pictures of from right here, they went ahead and they paid for their own renourishment. Um, they actually have a big shoal. You might be able to see a little bit of it right back here, but there's a big shoal there that they take the sand and they pump it on here and then it wraps back around and every couple of years they pump it back. 
So they have a nice little source back here that they've been using. Um, for the rest of the beach, I don't know exactly what they're going to be doing to handle that in the future. We are trying to find a couple of areas that might be reasonable sand resources. The last time that they renourished all of Folly Beach, they had chunks of rock that were about this large that showed up on the beaches. And, you know, in Greece, rocks on beaches are natural and, and you know, fun. Here on Folly Beach, they don't like rocks on their beach. Um, it should be nice, soft sand. Can, can you repeat that loudly? In, in the United States, there are a couple of different mechanisms. Um, in, renourishment is a primary one. Um, the, in, the installation of groins, um, such as in this case, if you notice, there's a very sharp line here. Because Folly Beach has had problems for so many decades because of the federal government, it actually has its own rule set, its own regulations within the state. They are allowed to have some jetties, and this one got placed in, and you can see that the sediment is accumulating here. And that's where they want it. Here's the parking lot, here are the cars, here are some dunes that are being built. Um, it does tend to erode more heavily down drift. So this is at the end of the island. It really doesn't matter as much because Folly has been heavily impacted by humans. Um, so groins like this, or terminal groins as this one is called, are allowed um, and do help out in certain situations. Um, areas other areas that have had like the jetty, for example, you see the jetty here coming in? It comes in somewhere right around here. These people used to have beachfront property right here. Um, if, let me see if, give me just a second and let me bring up another image. Let me see if this is, yeah. Oh. So that's the same little area. If you notice, in the 80s, the shoreline was back here. Can you see that? These people on these houses, 1930s, a lot of these houses were built during the 40s and 50s and 60s and rebuilt in the 90s and 2000s after the hurricanes. Um, but they have been complaining because if you look, instead of a beautiful beachfront property that would have been here in the 1980s, they have to walk three, 400 meters to get to the beach. So they have too much sand this is maybe the same sand that should be down at Folly Beach to the south. But because of the jetty, it's accumulating on the backside of it and keeping it out of the inlet and keeping it off of Folly is the idea behind that. And so now they've got bushes and trees in front of their homes, which is great protection against the storms. But you'll notice that all these bushes and trees, this group right here, they actually just went out and cut it illegally. It's not their property. It's the city's property, but they, they went out and cut all the trees down so they could still see the ocean. But the next big storm that comes in, where is the water going to flow? Right up in here. And these six houses are going to be in big trouble where these will be protected from the vegetation. Now, if it's a really big storm, everybody's going to get wet. So beach renourishment is one of the major tools that we use in South Carolina to keep the beaches healthy. You could argue that that 
doesn't keep the beaches healthy, but to at least protect the houses and the infrastructure from storm damage. Groins and jetties are only used in a few special places. Um, and then, yeah, does that make sense? Did that answer your question? Yes. Okay, great. Uh, the East Coast has a lot of hurricanes, so what's, uh, do they have any systems to protect uh, the people there from the hurricanes? Or aren't the people scared of the hurricanes that might come to uh, the East Coast? Uh, oh, on falling? Yes, on falling, but uh, generally in the East Coast. No, so what we do, um, like in this past fall, uh, whoops, this past fall, we actually, um, because of, our, of this Hurricane Matthew that was coming through, um, and it, I don't know if you remember hearing about Hurricane Matthew, but it really, it came up along the coast, and actually it came right along here and was supposed to go right into Charleston. It actually went up into here, but it strafed Charleston so badly. We had huge amounts of damage, but when they realized that down here, we had a couple of days and all the, all the computer models were showing that the storm was going to hit South Carolina, um, Florida, Georgia, everybody evacuated from the coast. So we had mandatory evacuations that everybody had to follow. So we actually, um, Laura and I took the pets, my little dog, my little dog is behind me right now. Um, but uh, we took the animals and we went up here to Virginia with my mom and dad and hung out for a few days until they let us come back. Um, so they do evacuate, but as far as protecting the houses, they're on their own until the storm's over. But this is a very unstable situation. What would be like uh, the end or what the, how is the future going to go? How are the what? How is the future going to go? How, what's going to happen? If there are hurricanes, the beaches are eroding all over the place. What's the <laughs> Well, um, in the law, it actually, it states that if a house is more than two thirds destroyed, that they cannot rebuild. Now that, as soon as we have a big storm that destroys a house that much, if we deny that permit as a state, then there will probably be a heavy lawsuit. Um, they will fight it legally because the land is worth so much money. Um, but realistically, so the politics are the wealthy people live at the coast and they want to keep their beachfront property. That's, that's sort of the bottom line. The reality is sea level is rising, our shores are eroding, and it's not sustainable. In other words, unless we put a big concrete wall up there and let the beaches disappear, these houses are going to have, they're going to go away. <laughs> And the thing is, the beach is public. And so anybody is allowed to go to the beach. And when a home causes that beach to be gone, in other words, people cannot have access to the sandy beach, then that causes a conflict between the public and the private ownership rights. And so that's going to be a big lawsuit that's going to come up at some point in the future and it's going to happen time and time again until we're able to agree both from the public and from the private standpoint but it's a huge problem so that's on the beaches it's hard to put a big concrete wall up on a beach because then the beach disappears but downtown in charleston so on the coasts the politicians do not believe sea level is rising. They do not believe that it's a problem. And it's something that can be solved. <laughs> That's the politicians. You, you know how politicians are. Um, however, in Charleston, in the city, you notice the very sharp angles. It's already surrounded by concrete. 
And so in the city, the politicians are arguing that sea level is rising and we need to prepare for it because the wealthy people want to prepare for sea level rise. What's interesting is the people who live here who believe in sea level rise often have houses on different islands and I don't know how they, I don't know how they think that sea level was rising here and not here. It's, it's a quandary. It's a, it's a big question I have. I have not run into the person who owns a house here and there. I know they exist and I really look forward to seeing them in the public hearings and the meetings because it'll be a very good conversation to have. <laughs> Other questions? Thoughts? Things you wanted to hear but you didn't? <laughs> if you have questions, don't hesitate to um, get my email from Yanis or Vasilis. Um, they can help out. And um, I'm happy to answer any questions you might have in the future. Oh, thank you. Good seeing y'all. And um, I'll go ahead and stop recording. Okay. Oh, good.